Every year, the Integrative Center for Learning and Memory, uh, and this is our 42 faculty, choose a speaker that uh, will come and give us the, the Distinguished Integrative Center for Learning and Memory lecture. You know, someone that has made extraordinary contributions to the field. This year, the Integrative Center for Learning and Memory Distinguished Speaker is Dr. Yuri Busaki. Uh, Yuri was born in Hungary and he graduated with an MD from the University of Pex in 1974. Uh, I remember what I was doing in 1974, actually. It was, it was an important time for Portugal, actually. It was a, a big revolution, so anyway, okay. Uh, <laughs> he received his PhD in neuroscience from the Academy of Sciences in Budapest in 1984, and he is currently the bigs professor of neurosciences and physiology and, 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 and neurology at NYU. His lab studies how coordinated rhythmic activity in the brain underlies a myriad of functions such as memory. One of my favorite opening sentences in any paper is in Yuri's 2004 science paper. He writes, and I quote, clocks tick, bridges and skyscrapers vibrate, Neuronal networks oscillate. Are, are neuronal oscillations an inevitable byproduct similar to bridge, uh, to bridge vibrations or an essential part of the brain's design? I love that. <laughs> uh, you know, this kind of sort of poetic streak runs through a lot of his papers, actually, which I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I can say safely that... Uh, Yuri and many people that follow this pioneering work have conclusively addressed that question, actually. The enormous influential idea that he has championed is that self-emerging oscillatory timing in the brain uh, is a fundamental principle of neuronal information organization and, and, and coordination. Brain rhythms are a key to packaging and segmenting uh, information in the brain, and this is key to brain communication and organizing function, as I already said, across a wide ranging of time scales. Five orders of magnitude, right? Something like that. I seem to, you know, to remember. His lab had a key role in identifying not only, a, and, and characterizing not only a lot of these oscillations, but also their mechanisms. Uh, his lab, for example, was one of the first to, uh, to demonstrate the key role of GABAergic interneurons in theta and gamma oscillations. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful things and concepts that his lab introduced. Uh, one of my favorite is this beautiful, really beautiful, hierarchical metastructure organization of brain rhythms with slower oscillations phase modulating the power of faster rhythms. I, a lot of sort of interesting, novel, beautiful concepts. Uh, I'm sure you're, you, you are probably familiar with the two-stage model of memory trace. Uh, memory trace uh, consolidation, and I don't know if you know this or not, but this is also a concept that Yuri brought into, into neuroscience and that many labs have since shown its validity and usefulness. Uh, finally, I want to encourage you to read this influential book, Rhythms of the Brain, which is really a wonderful account of how cortical cells and circuits give rise to higher cognitive function. So without further ado, let, uh, please join me in welcoming this year's Integrated Center for Learning and Memory distinguished speaker, Dr. Yuri Busaki. Yuri, welcome. I'm always scared in this room. You know, that UCLA has a magnificent group of neuroscientists. When I was a young student and I learned about neuroscience, that was the time when uh, Magoon and Morizzi were working here. There was the Brain Research Institute, uh, the famous neurosurgeons. Uh, uh, Jack French was working here. And every single time I come here, I have to face some problems. And the problems are, of course, in me, but my presentations are always not contradicted, but discussed heavily by, by faculty at UCLA. This is an uh, extraordinary group of people, large in size and extremely high in quality. So I'm, this, I'm sure the students are aware of this, that you are really privileged to have the choice of going from one lab to another lab and find one international uh, 
hero to another. Uh, and I'm humbled to be the speaker of this uh, distinguished event. And uh, when I read the history of this, it seemed, it seemed that you are requiring something that is unusual, which is not talking about what happened last week in my laboratory, but some bigger picture. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, I'm not sure everybody will enjoy it, <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I do what I can. So I thought that the take-home message of my, my talk is very simple. You are all on the wrong track. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to fix it. We have to take you into the right direction. So what is the wrong track? The wrong track starts with this list. And uh, everybody in this room can pick one of them and say, oh, I belong to the this instinct guys. I belong to the reasoning guy. I belong to the sensation crowd. And I enjoy that. I try to understand it. And I'm going to devote my entire life to this. There is an interesting thing in this list, of course, that you can see this is a, these are chapters. This is basically the Bible of neuroscience. And every Bible is written by somebody. This was written by whom? By us. By us. <laughs> the most famous psychologist of the last century. Yeah, I heard that. Who said that? Oh, these are old guys. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so William James. So William James was the person who has written this encyclopedia, this is called the Principles of Psychology, that has all these chap chapters. And all these chapters comprise everything that we do today. There is something unusual about this. Namely, that was conceived in 1890. There was no brain research. Where did he get the words from? He got it from the British empiricist. And where did the British empiricist got this word from? They got it from Christian Europe. Where did they get the words from? From the Greeks. So we can go back and say, did Aristotle n could make this list? And the answer is yes. He could have made up these words. And many of these words are made up by humans. What do we do today? We take any, any, some of these, or one of these, and said, I'm going to find a box in the brain. I'm looking for a structure in the brain that will do what is there. And I'm looking to find the mechanisms and boundaries of the mechanisms that correspond to the boundaries of the items that are on this list. This is super naive. How is it possible that people, our predecessors, who made up words would ever correspond something that has a similar boundary in the brain. Of course, the first consequence of this was that people were trying to find homes for these words, and they did find it. You know, the mechanisms were a little debatable because we can all understand that bumps on the skull are not exactly the place where we are looking for the, uh, the free will and, and, and belief and so on. So we ridiculed them. But I forgive the phrenologist for the wrong strategy, the wrong method, which was looking for bumps. But I cannot forgive them for the real crime, which is they took seriously these words. And that, of course, was back then. Today is so much different. We have, we have fMRI, we've got imaging, MEG. We are in contemporary science, right? But the problem is that the words are too many. And if you, if you would like to put them somewhere, then first of all, you know, if it's about memory, you put it in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, if those of you who are following the literature these days, there are about 50 different terms that have been invented over the past five years only. If you look at the parietal cortex, I've got about 100 terms for the parietal cortex. For the hippocampal theta, I've got over 150. If you don't understand something, you put it in the trash can of the brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then you have this large number of items that you put there because they don't fit anywhere else. So it's difficult to fight with everybody with all of these terms. But let's reduce the number of terms that are there. So I just picked three from James' list. And this is the perception of 
things, the perception of space and the perception of time. Now, why is it important for many of us? It is important because these things were taken seriously when and where Tulving coined the term or the expression is that episodic memory is the kind of memory that makes us as individuals is the following thing. What happened to me? What happened to me where and when? And that with this, this definition, we thought neuroscience has a goal. All you have to figure out now, where is the what stored and processed? The second is where is the time stored and processed, or processed and stored? And the third one is the space. So we have these two axes, space and time, that of course, philosophers like Ivan or Kant thought this is all beyond us. They existed forever and so on. Therefore, we, we, all we have to do in the brain is to find mechanisms to each of these three and then combine them. And once we combine them, we have episodic memory. The interesting thing about this is that this is all European science. And not everybody thinks this particular way because the, the coordinate system is already expresses the elements of Newtonian mechanics or the Newtonian world that in fact there is such a thing as space which is a big theater, a big container into which you can throw in things. And there is a time there is a, which is an arrow that goes from here to there and everything that happens in the world can be put on a timeline. Now. That's again, as I said, it's said European philosophy. Other philosophies think differently. So when it, when it comes to changing the world, you can say there are religions and there are beliefs that say, no, there is no change whatsoever in the world. If there are changes that show term and then there are recurrences, recurrences, recurrences. So this is one type of philosophy. The other type of philosophy is the British empiricist, or this is our philosophy, is that indeed, Something happens and it never happens again, started with, with, with Heraclitus. So this was a great idea because space and time are invented by humans not so long ago, maybe uh, 20, 30, 50,000 years ago, when we, we tried to see how small or contrast how small we are relative to the infiniteness of the universe, the infiniteness of space and the infinite uh, span of, of, of time compared to our lifetime. But of course, these are speculations only that science cannot do anything with it because they are not measurable. Space and time cannot be measure, measured. So what science did is said, oh, we have to convert these things into measurable terms. And then we invented distance and duration. And once distance and durations were invented, they said, we have instruments that can be used to measure Distance. Here is the rod. Here is the clock. It could be a, a, a sundial or anything, but we can, we can do it. And once we see that instrument that is so different from this instrument, if, they are, if these things are measured by different instruments, therefore they should be different. And in fact, this is Immanuel Kant's definition, that space and time are independent from each other, and they are independent from everything else in the universe. So we are back to our initial problem that indeed this is what we have to find. However, in all cultures, space and time are intertwined. In fact, even in our usual speech, when we are talking about it, when we are asking, you know, how far is the beach? You know, you don't ask it, but I do, because when I come to California, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> uh, it said, you don't say it's five miles, you say five minutes. And of course, you have to say five minutes by car and so on. But you convert, typically, time into space and vice versa. In every single culture which has the concept of time and space. But that's not every single living culture. There are people who still live with us, in the Amandaba people in the Amazons and the, the Aborigines in Australia, who have no concept of time whatsoever. There is no tomorrow, there is no yesterday, there is no duration, there is no, no nothing. Uh, they understand sequences, but they don't have a concept of time. And if you are looking for, for, for details about these fascinating things, then I recommend uh, uh, Dean's uh, recent book about, you know, your brain is a time machine. 
and uh, all the details, or uh, many of these details are there. But it's not only the Asian people, but also contemporary science is about it. That when we are measuring distances, you know, we couldn't imagine our lives anymore. Our hippocampus is shrinking because everybody is using a GPS. And, and, and so we, 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 we have measured, we have instruments that guide us to go through space and measure distances. In fact, it says go five kilometers and then or five miles and, and go left and so on. But these instruments don't even use distance. They have no distance metric. They don't even have time metric, by the way. All they measure is phase. So we have an interesting question is that, uh -huh, now what is this thing that is created by humans, but we have measuring instruments, but once you have them, then you can pose further questions. So this is the sequence. You have a concept, you have a problem, you generate an instrument, you measure something, then you have a further question. So then the further questions are not only that the, how long and things like that, but also discrete items on this line. So where am I? This is very, very important. And so what time is it? But the interesting things, of course, is that the duration and the part of the duration or the, or the discrete part is what time is it cannot be separated because if you look at the, the now or here, this is the end of a duration or a distance. And vice versa, the, a, a, a duration is something in between two discrete points. So the two of them are interdependent and one assumes the other. And then we get into trouble because this is where the trouble occurs in, in, in contemporary physics is whether things are continuous or they are discrete. So, of course, this could be quantified further and further and said, oh, if there is such a parallel between the two systems, the two axes, the time and space, then probably every segment or every aspect of space and time should have some correspondence in the other. And indeed there is, if you look at the spatial and temporal domains, there is position, there is time point, there is distance and speed. One is, a, if you can vectorize it, then it's vectorial. If you have arrow of time, then time becomes a vector and so on. But you come back over and over and over again to this problem. What I said so far is probably pretty boring. It shouldn't affect anybody who's doing actual experiments because uh, these are philosophical issues only and who cares? Except when you do things like this, you know, when you fix the head and then you are trying uh, to figure out what is the difference between a head fixed situation or when the animal is moving freely. And people like my young Mechdog sometimes get surprised and said, well, the brain treats the two situations totally and absolutely differently because in one case there is a vector, in the other case there is no vector involved. So when you say the animal is running for five years but it doesn't get anywhere, then what does it mean for the brain and so on? So I'm just showing you that indeed we have some problems. So when, you, when I say there is this, this, the way how it works, science works is that you make up something, you know, mathematics is at least honest, Mathematicians say we are working with axioms. We make an axiomatic system and from then on everything is just perfect. And the reason why it is perfect because we have assumptions. Science says we have no assumptions, except we do. We have at least two axioms, the time and space. These are the anchors. Without them, it's hard to exist or hard to do anything. So this, of course, worked extremely well for a long, long period of time. But this is Newtonian science. So space and time is perfect. There's a container and the line that I, I told you. But the problem is that Einstein came along and, and other people uh, debated it. And they said, well, maybe they are not independent. Maybe there is no such a thing as time arrow and things like that. Does it have any impact on neuroscience? And you know, when when people ask me the same question, said, well, wait a second, you know, I don't understand what your problem with time is. My answer is the same as the, the answer of, of the, the frustrated Einstein, that if you are really interested in time, just look at the clocks. But this is a practical answer. It doesn't sweep the problem under the rug and doesn't solve it. So, like Dean, I have read probably every single book about space and time that has written by physicists. The, interesting thing that you summarize in a sentence is that the last chapter of every of these books is always about God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And the reason for that is because they don't have a good solution. So <laughs> my answer is that it, over the time, it's not a physics problem. It's a problem for neuroscience. If some, anybody has to face this issue, it's the neuroscientists that have to solve it. But how do we do that? <coughs> and why we do that? Uh, Carlo Rovelli, if anybody knows this uh, fantastic uh, physics poet, uh, who writes extremely well, he made this wonderful sentence that serves as a guide for us that we have to deal with these issues. There is no container where we can put things in it. There is no timeline onto which we can do it. So now we have a problem with the definition of episodic memory. So how do we go by? Said, well, we don't exactly know, but you, what you can see in neuroscience is that people have done work on memory. People who have done a lot of work in the striatum. Half of them worked in the cerebellum, the other half in the striatum. People, maybe a, a, a fraction worked in the parietal cortex. The people who are interested in space worked in the parietal cortex in the hippocampal system. And some people who are interested in circadian times, they go into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And over the past five years, two Nobel Prizes were given for time and space. So let's pick on space, or let's talk about space. You read the headlines a couple of years ago that people, outstanding people who are extraordinary outstanding people, they are the best of our business for sure, found the GPS of the brain. They didn't find the GPS and they, they denied it. They don't want to deal with that. But nevertheless, let's take this, this uh, metaphor uh, seriously that there is a mechanism in the brain that gives you a navigational map. This is the map metaphor of navigation. So what do we need for that? When you come to New York and you have a map and you emerge from the subway, the first thing you would like to do is use the map. And how you use the map? First you have to orient the map to find uptown. And this is what the head direction cells do. The second thing is that there is a grid also on the map. It says 1B, 2C, and so on. You have a destination where you would like to go. That's on the map. You have to figure out where are things relative to each other. The third very important thing to look at where you are you have to localize yourselves on the map. And there is one last thing that you would like to know, which is how far things are, which is the calibration there. We don't exactly know how the calibration works in, in the brain, but we need that signal also because you have to determine whether you are walking there or you are taking a cap. But this map metaphor, of course, is not sufficient because a map is just a map. It's static, and it doesn't give you navigation. It doesn't give you... It, this is all, all, all dead things. These are the environment. They are things that are outside. On the other hand, navigation is about action. You have to figure out and measure by the brain translocation, velocity, and also you need either measuring instruments out there or you need sensors in the brain that are capable of sensing these things uh, that, that happen. And there is a beautiful... Uh, 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 paper by McNaughton, Barnes and, and colleagues a while ago that shifted from the map idea to the real navigation idea that requires the animals to move around rather than just uh, absorb the ideas. By the way, if I go back to the very beginning of my talk, I said there is a common element of all those things that are characterized uh, Christian philosophies, Greek philosophies, uh, British empiricism, Pavlovian, Gestalt, whatever, they are all, I call them, outside-in theories. Because they assume that the brain is, exists and the brain is there to learn the truth, which is the reality in the outside world. And we absorb things, and the brain is an absorption device, rather than a venturer that has to go out into the world and, ex ex and explore it and discover things. So that's... Uh, uh, that's, that's what is reflected in all of this, that there is a passive brain that just absorbs things from outside. So the navigation comes into two flavors. Many of you know that there is a dead reckoning time of, of, of navigation, and there's other one that I talked about, it's a map-based navigation. In order to generate a map, we have to explore the world first. We have to go from one place to another, and every single part of the world has to be explored in order to have a precise map. The advantage of this is that once you have that map, then you can go from anywhere to anywhere else. Any of the combinatorics can be worked out. 
And if you are human, you can make that map and give it to somebody else. But you have to be a, a human to generate that. So the, 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 the sequence of events is that you explore, you, you generate something, and then you can utilize it very effectively. This is much more efficient most of the time than dead reckoning type of navigation. So what is the relationship of all this navigation to memory? Well, it turns out that it's good that memory also has two components. One is what you can call episodic memory, which is the same kind of thing. It's self-reference or egocentric that requires your first person experience in space and in time. What happened in my laboratory when we discovered the quasars or something? And then that can be published and give it to others, or other people can do the same thing, and many people look at it from different angles, and all the spatial temporal conditions that were associated with discoveries are stripped off, and the facts remain, and these facts are called semantic information. So semantic information is explicit, it's very similar to the XY coordinates in the, 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 the place neurons or the, the place map uh, that is generated by the hippocampus. So what I'm saying here is that nature initially invented a mechanism that allowed an animal to move around and make predictions and, and, and verify those predictions and interact with the external world constantly. External world constantly. And with time, those things get internalized. And that internalized mechanism allows that you no longer have to try out everything. You don't have to go right or left. You don't have to, to go to five different schools before you decide that I want to go to graduate schools in neuroscience rather than physics or geography or literature or something else. Because in your mind, you do this mental travel and you evaluated the consequences based on your experience. But the algorithm in the structures that are involved in this, the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, antenna cortex, are doing pretty much the same thing. So internalized travel or mental travel is based on the navigation system that has been worked out by, by, by the evolution to interact with the world. So if, it, if this is so, then indeed there must be patterns in the brain that allows me to give this talk. And the reason why I can give this talk is because I have a trajectory, a neural trajectory in my brain that was started when the Alcino says, it's your time. So then was an initial condition, and then my trajectory is traveling in a particular direction. I know sort of where my goal is, and it goes around and around and around this, this n-dimensional space of the CA3 region of the hippocampus and, 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 and the rest of the brain. So, there must be assemblies that live for a while, give this information to another assembly, which live for a while, and then another assembly, and another assembly, and the sequences go forever. In fact, if you have time, I have time, I can talk to you, you know, five hours here, without using any cues from the environment. So, there are at least two ways of generating sequences. This is the, the, the simple one, which is, place cells one, place cell two, place cell three, four, five in the hippocampus. And the reason why they are firing in sequences, this is the story, what, what tells us is because the environmental signals are driving these neurons. First, this corner is, uh, this P1 neuron is, is driven by this corner, and the second neuron is by this other corner and the relationship between the corner and the, the chair and so on. So it is assumed in John O'Keefe, who will uh, you hear several times in my talk, who assumes that everything is coming from outside world, and it's like V1 in a sense, that there is a causal relationship between the firing activity and what's coming into the brain. So this is what you can call it's, uh, it's coming from outside. The other one is what I just mentioned to you, that we don't need the external world. Most of it is internally organized. And if there is an internal organization, then there are many trajectories. Many, many trajectories. In fact, you can ask yourself, how many trajectories do I have compared to Alcino? You can vote. <laughs> do I have more or less? <laughs> so what about the person who has never experienced, a brain that never experienced anything? My answer is that that brain has pretty much the same number. 
of trajectories. Trajectories, that is, dynamical patterns, are made by the brain by its own internal dynamic. It's not experience dependent. The, the number of sharp wave ripples and things like that, they don't depend on how many and how deep experience you had. If that is the case, then maybe learning and memory has very little to do with the idea that everything is coming from the outside in a tabula rasa fashion and, and all the learning is imposing sequences on the brain. Quite the contrary. Learning is nothing else but matching an existing experience, well, matching an experience with a pre-existing or existing trajectory. It's a selection. It's like a, you have a, 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 a dictionary that is full with nonsense words. And then you make sense of some of the words by experience. And then in your lifetime, some of the words, not all, will be gaining meaning to you or to the organism. It's a different kind of thinking. I call it inside out. So let's see how it actually works. Now let's see two neurons first. How do they relate to each other? So this is a rat that goes from left to right. And then you can see there's a green neuron and red neuron. And then they have a spatial relationship because the green neuron has a peak here. The red neuron has a peak here. So now I can take my ruler that was invented by some other human. I can measure the distance between the, the, the two. Then I can take my clock and I can ask, what is the temporal relationship between these two neurons inside the brain? And what I find, and uh, 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 it, it, it's pretty clear, and you can see that there that, that the distance, a temporal distance here, is relatively fixed because this is fixed, that the distances there in the outside world are translated into time. In fact, this is not real time because it's the phase of the ongoing hippocampal theta oscillation. So we already see here is that what I said in folk psychology that time and space are related. Time and space are also related in a way that if you have something in between, and, and I'll show you in the next slide, which is speed, then one of them is redundant. If you have information about speed, then you need time to calculate distance. If you have distance, you can calculate time. One of them can be thrown out. So what if the animal is going through the place field fast or slow? If the animal goes through the, the place field with, with, with twice the speed, then it takes only about five theta cycles to go from here to here. If the animal is going slow, it ten, takes 10 theta cycles. So now what happens? What happens is that the number of you can count the number of spikes, and you can see that the number of spikes, those are the ticks, red and, and the blue stick, or the, the, the green and the blue stick, they are pretty much the same. And it, almost independent how fast or slow the animal runs, the number of spikes are pretty much the same. So that it means that when the animal is running faster, the number of spikes per theta cycles double. If, it, if there are more spikes in a given amount of time, then it means that stronger depolarization. It's a stronger shift. It's a stronger shift of the phase preference from one theta cycle to the next theta cycle. And if you look at the oscillation frequency, if you can generate an autocorrelogram of, of, of these, the ticks here, and then you can see that these are like voltage-dependent oscillators, or in this case, it's speed-dependent oscillators. The faster the animal runs, the faster the oscillation frequency of this play cell is. Now, this is good news because itself, in itself, is not very useful, but when you have access to the speed, then now you have time, and with time and speed, you can generate distance, and then you will see that the phase of the, of the theta cycle where this, the action potentials occur is exactly the same during slow and fast speeds, and it's related to the position of the animal. If you didn't understand it, don't worry. What it basically said, this was John O'Keefe's second major discovery, is that you can take only a snapshot of time, which is 100 milliseconds or so in the theta cycle, ask which phase of the theta oscillation the, the neuron spikes, and you have a good and intelligent guess where the animal is, because that is a relationship between position of the animal in the real world and the spiking of the neuron during the theta cycle. But his explanation was that somehow this sink is further proof for the fact that indeed the external world 
is providing the signals. And the reason why there is a fixed relationship between position and, and the spiking is because the external world controls it, which is impossible. The horizon wave is impossible because the theta oscillation is generated in here. It has no relationship to the events outside there. Instead, what happens is that you have a self-generated pattern, an oscillatory pattern. It generates temporal offsets, and from the temporal offsets, you can calculate distances from the beginning to the end of the place field with the help of speed. So we already see that speed and time are related to each other. We, we don't know which one is primary, which one is more important, but we are seeing that it's actually it's difficult to separate the two. Now let's see another experiment, which is asking what would happen in a situation when you would freeze an animal here and now. And the good theories have, are good theories because have, they have explicit prediction. So the mapping theory of John O'Keefe is that if you freeze an animal here and you maintain the theta oscillation by some miracle, then there will be a subset of neurons in the hippocampus which will tell the here and now, and they would fire forever as long as the animal is here. And there are some other predictions that we, we also tested. So that's what we would like to investigate. As opposed to the idea that I, I already predicted or, or, or discussed a little bit, that we don't need the environment. I just rely on my self-organized activity. And if that is the case, we shouldn't find any of those neurons. So this is an ex experiment, which uh, I, I, I liked a lot, that we thought about for a long, long time. And then we came up with this uh, idea that this is a hippocampal dependent task where the animal is going to the right or going to the left. If it go, uh, goes to the right, then it's rewarded. It has to remember, oh, I came from the right, now I have to go to the left. It's a spontaneous alternation task, which is hippocampus dependent. The only trick that we introduced here is that the animal has to wait anywhere between 10 seconds to 20 seconds and run facing always in the same direction. So in our power, we have done everything possible to make sure that the idiothetic information from the body is constant and the environmental inputs are constant. So if there are no changes from the outside the brain, then the prediction is that, that there should be a neuron that fires forever and it never happens. Instead, what happens is that every single neuron that you look at is that it fires on every single trial uh, at two seconds, the other words, it's not distance in the wheel, but you can uh, use, so it doesn't matter whether we use distance or, or, or time in, in the wheel because they are convertible to each other through speed. So you can see this, uh, for example, neurons. Now you can compress all these uh, trials into a session average, and you can see that if you have enough number of neurons, then the entire journey is tessellated by some kind of uh, of, uh, of uh, activity of the neurons. There's a continuum there. Now let's examine just uh, one neuron. And the reason why we'd like to zoom into this is because this trajectory is very interesting. The reason why it is interesting is because every single time the initial condition is the same, that is the animal is coming from one direction or the other direction, it's going in one direction. If it came from the left and plans to go to the right, this is one trajectory. If the animal does the opposite decision, then it goes to a different direction. So embedded in this sequence, there must be information about the memory of the experience that was associated with reward and the memory of the future, that is the goal where the animal is heading. So let's look at one neuron just now. And I don't know if I have sound. <coughs> yes, I do. So this neuron is firing. And you will see that when it fired, the animal goes to the left. It's in this particular trial now, it's very silent. It's not going anywhere. Now it goes to the right. So now you have left, right, firing, <laughs> not firing. So we can already make a prediction. The urine is firing, so the animal will go to the left. And so on, and we can, we can keep doing it. But this is only one urine. It's, it's remarkably distinctive. It can tell you exactly which direction the animal will go 20 seconds later. But this neuron itself is useless, absolutely useless to guide behavior because it fired only for a short period of time. And there is another 15 seconds or 14 seconds to gap, which this neuron is not capable of. 
Luckily, this, this neuron is not alone. There is another neuron, another neuron, another neuron. They fire in a differential way where the animal goes to the left or goes to the right. And if you look at all of them, all neurons that you cause from simultaneously, then you can see there is a nice trajectory. Uh, what happened here is that you take each trial separately, you make a trajectory depending on whether the animal's future choice was to the right, and you get the one on the above. And here, the IDs, or identities of the neurons are the same. This is the first neuron, first neuron, second neuron, second neuron. And you can see that at any time slot, you can make a pretty reliable guess whether the animal will go to the left or right with 90% accuracy, if you have enough cells, including errors. So you can tell in advance also whether the animal will commit an error. So you have seen already that perhaps by chance uh, there is time here. So from the evolution of this activity, you could relate this activity to a clock. And you can say how bad or how good it is. And then this is how good it is. These are three different animals shown on the right here. And shows that even after 18 seconds, the errors are not so bad. This is about 10, 15%. And the more neurons you have, the less error rate you have. For those of you in the audience who are super specialists and read the last paper by the Mosers, this is a better coding than the coding in the lateral and anterior cortex. It's much more precise. So this happens that you can have a comparison, which is we always, we can relay this to something else, including a man-made instrument, which is a clock, and say, aha, uh -huh, these neurons are time cells. I didn't say that, but then came along my, my good friend, who, whom we, 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 we mourn heavily, uh, seriously because he just passed away, but he took this to heart and said, aha, uh -huh, hippocampal neurons already have the space axis. They have the what axis. What is missing is the time axis. So he called these time cells. And the interesting thing, what, what you see here, is that the animals were trained in the treadmill and said, run for the same duration. And then when animals run for the same duration, sometimes slow, sometimes fast, you can see that these cells could be duration cells because that neuron fired only at the end, other neurons somewhere in the middle, and so on. So the entire journey, just like in, in the wheel experiment, was firing somewhere. And he said, well, what about if the animal is trained to, to, to run for the different distance? Then he said, oh, it's different. Now, the bottom line is the, the, of the finding, this is not necessarily Howard's interpretation, that luckily he also has the speed here. And you can say, if you have speed, if you have, have uh, distance, you can calculate the time. The two of them are intertwined. The other important thing is that 95% of the neurons, 93% of the neurons, were coding both distance and time, inseparably. A small fraction of neurons tended to have some preference to one or the other, but perhaps it's nothing else, just the sensitivity to speed input of those neurons. Overall, it seems that, indeed, that's the case, that, that it's neither distance nor time, which is coded by the brain, but something else. So let's see what, is, what something else is available. Something else is, is illustrated here, that these are different trials, you can see, and the different dots are different neurons. So the black neuron, you can see, is dominating at the beginning of the journey, and the red neurons are at the, at the end. And so you see that from trial to trial, there is quite a bit of variability from, for each of these neurons. And there is no real good order. But you can plot it also as a function of time, which is also ugly. Now what you do is you plot these neurons as a function of theta cycles. And all of a sudden, you see a much crispier order. And the reason for that is that if there is such a thing as an organizer, I don't call it time or clock or anything, it's just theta cycles. Theta cycles can be longer, shorter, longer, shorter, and vary as a function of speed. And then, depending on the animal's behavior, the jitter will be large or slow. But if you look at just the cycles, there is a cyclic organization within which there is a beautiful order. So, what do we conclude so far? And he said, well, I've been able to record neurons from the hippocampus, which relate to distance measures. 
I've been able to record neurons that relate to time measures. Each of these measures are related to an instrument that was made by somebody. Does it mean that indeed we identified a neural mechanism of time coding or distance coding? And my answer is not, because we made a logical error. The logical error is that just because there is a temporal sequence that is being represented, it's not the same as representations or, or as the representation of a temporal sequence. I hope you understand this. And if you ever studied Aristotelian logic, it says that there is a difference between the explanans and the explanandum, or the difference between the things to be explained and the things that explains. In, in a correlative system, the two looks identical, but they are not. So there is no easy way how we can say from these experiments that indeed we found a answer to the long standing question about whether we have an axiom or we have two axioms, which is space and time, and we find neural mechanisms. There is one more problem, a couple of them. The, the, the first problem is this. The hippocampus is a large sausage that corresponds to the rest of the neocortex. It, it gets this information from large areas of the neocortex, and it reports back to the neocortex. Now, in a rodent, which has a small neocortex, most of the information is from sensory motor. And this, only this redness in the ventral hippocampus, that is a little distinct because that part corresponds or, 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 or have projections and connections with those structures that are in the cortex, eventually we will call associational cortex. Another wonderful name. Remember, associational cortex? It comes from the British empiricist, because the idea was that this area of the cortex has a job, which is associate things from outside the world. But if you go to a larger brain, things are different now, because what happens with the, the, the mammalian evolution is that the neocortex grows and the hippocampus gets into a ventral direction, but the hippocampus keeps representing every part of the neocortex, but the larger part of the neocortex is now non-allied or higher order cortex. So most of the connections will be, in fact, not to sensory and motor areas. And every part of the hippocampus keeps doing the same thing, depending, independent of the inputs. The hippocampus is modality blind. It has no clue whether it's one kind of information, another kind of information comes in. It always does the same thing. So depending on whether you set up your experiment that you are looking for time or duration, you will find it. If you're looking for space, you will find it. If you are looking for sound frequency change, uh, I'm referring to the tank experiments that many of you know, then you find it. Or you can find many, many other things. So you can conclude it that many of the findings that we have is experimental dependent. Because we cannot really do an experiment of many, many, many variables. We just choose one or two. And if we do it, then we will find the answer. The, Important thing, of course, is that it's totally irrelevant whether we call these place cells or time cells, because if the downstream neurons don't interpret them as separate, there's no point of separating them from our point of view. So what we have to find is indeed find a reader of this information. Now, the reader can be anywhere. So one of the easiest things to say, oh, for example, we would like to find, figure out how is this map translated into footsteps. Then we just send the information back to the neocortex and then something will happen. The other one is that, no, 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 you really have to send this information to somewhere that has a shorter cut, such as the lateral septum, because it has the highest density of the hippocampal output. It has also uh, not only the CA1 region that is receiving input, such as the internal cortex, but both CA3 and CA1 come together. And the lateral septum has access to the motivational centers of the brain, the lateral hypothalamus. It also has direct access to the locomotion zones of the mesencephalon and so on. So it's a good place or good structure to look, look at. So people have looked at the lateral septum for a long time, not too many laboratories, but whenever they recorded from the lateral septum, Blair, you recorded from the lateral septum, you found not so exciting things. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> it's not published yet, but we see it very clearly, yes. 
So the, you don't see a place map there. So what happens to the place NIS information from the hippocampus? It's just totally not there if you are looking at the firing rates of these lateral septal neurons. But you will see some magic happens if you look at higher order relationship and you get information also about what happens above the lateral septum. So here's an example just to recapitulate what happens in the hippocampus. So this is a hippocampal CA1 neuron. What you can see in this tract, the animal is running around. Uh, there is a play cell here. And you can see that the firing rate increases, as shown here. But also, there is a phase relationship that I explained before. You can look at this segment, and this segment, and this segment. And it's much more informative than looking at the, uh, 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 the firing rate. But these codes are redundant, in a sense because we don't exactly know whether the phase is more important or the rate is more important. We show in this paper that indeed the, the phase is more important even in the hippocampus. But let's see what happens in the lateral septum, which is, a collect, is reading the collective output of the hippocampus. So we might expect to see some hints uh, of this, but we don't. So you, you can just focus on this side. You can see that whenever this lateral septum fires, it could be anywhere. There's absolutely no information given to the experimenter, or perhaps for the rest of the brain, about where the animal is. On the other hand, if you are, have information about the hippocampal theta cycle, then you can see that the phase relationship of these neurons are very telling. In fact, so much telling, if you have 50 neurons from the lateral septum, you can tell more precisely where the animal is in its journey compared to 50 C1 pyramidal cells in the hippocampus. So it seems that, and to make the long story short, that the, the, the lateral septum is reading out a divi division or divisive action, or perhaps the difference, we don't exactly understand that, from the CA3 to the CA3 input. And it can, because the CA1 and the CA3 are projecting to the same lateral septal neurons that work as a comparator, and then they may do something. Now, we, the reason why we speculate that this is the case, in fact, because we can look at many neurons and entire assemblies of neurons in CA3 and CA1 and relate it to the activity or the, the, the phase of the lateral septal neurons. And when we do it in CA1, we see that this doesn't change very much or, in fact, is decreasing from CA1. But from the CA3 region, it's increasing. So this relationship of the two hippocampal outputs are reflected in the phase of the lateral septal neurons. So to summarize that, what is important really is that it doesn't matter how we interpret the signals that we record from, from, the, from the brain, because we are in a privileged position. We have access to the world. We can see what's happening there. And we have access to the neuronal signal. So we see both. But neurons in the brain don't see anything else except the activity of the upstream neurons. So in order to call something information, we really have to translate it into how to the, to the observation how the downstream neurons of the activity that we record from uh, actually make sense of. So we return to the summary of uh, or was kind of summary uh, of what happened so far is that space and time are difficult concepts. We cannot understand them from first principles because we have no sensors. There is no sensor for space. There is no sensor for time. Uh, what we do have, though, is we have access to other signals, such as speed measurement. Uh, and of course, we can, we can say from here is that, indeed, there is nothing here that these are all made up by humans. And if they are made all by humans, then we have a problem. Is because how would animals interpret space and time when they don't know how to read the instruments that we made. How about children? How about those people who, who never had access and they were never taught to use those instruments? What does it, it mean for them? So I have a recommendation that we revise the definition of episodic memory. Just for recapitulation, this is Ember Tulving's definition, what happened to me, where, and when. And maybe what we can say is not that the hippocampus is not about that, but it just generates ordinal sequences. So the, the episodic memory would be nothing else but a continuum. It's an ordered sequence of events without referring to space or time. 
and this is an extension of the, what I just said, that indeed the, 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 the navigation in space or navigation in somewhere is nothing else but succession of events. So if you look at this way, then you ask what is the function of the hippocampus? And you can say the hippocampus is a sequence generator. It just can't help. It generates sequences all the time that happens to correspond to the time elapsed measured by instruments. But it doesn't mean that because there is a correspondence that it actually generates time. Uh, so with a metaphor, let me end and say, look, the hippocampus is a sequence generator. It's a hippocampus is like a librarian that knows not all the contents of the books, but it knows where the shelves are, where the real information occurs, and the shelves and the books represent the neocortex, and it can, can reach easily uh, or can instruct the neocortex which sequence the activity should be coming from, uh, should occur, and then, um, then once we can do that exercise, then we can perhaps address the same exact issues without ever referring to the concept of space and time. So what I talked about today is took, I took two difficult concepts, such as space and time, and 90% of the people in the room will disagree with me that this is not a good approach, I'm wasting my time. But I picked with, and started with space and time because they seem to be the most non-negotiable concepts. If we can take some inroads into shaking the foundations of your thinking, then the rest of the concepts, the rest of the list on the table of contents of William James probably will be a little bit easier. And as opposed to the outside-in strategy that we impose things on the brain, maybe we can start to understand how brain patterns are generated and how brain patterns are uh, accessed by the body and how the, the brain patterns can be associated or linked to real-world events. And this is what I call the inside-out approach. Thank you. There is no such a thing as time. <laughs> According to the clock. <laughs> Please, yep. Dean. Dean. Uh, great talk, thank you, Yuri. Just a quick question about the readout, question comment about the readout. So I totally agree that we have this representation such as sequences, and then what matters is how that information gets used. It can be used for space or time or velocity, depending on the context. But I think of the readout as something that has to approximate the output a bit more. The output is normally done in terms of rate or space, not phase. So when we talk about output of a behavior, we talk about these neurons being active or these being active at a different rate. When you have the phase in the lateral septum, I don't think that's any closer to a readout because phase isn't an adequate output for the brain. You have to still decode the phase. So it seems farther from the readout. Okay, so Dean identified a weakness, but it's not, <laughs> it's not fatal because I can say, well, this is true, but your next sentences or previous sentences are false, which is that, yes, the steps and things like that don't go into the rhythm, but they are not going in rate and things like that. I can say there are sequences, and there is nothing else, just sequence and rate of change. And if we keep to these two terms, and I understand what rate of change is, which is gain, and I know the mechanisms in the, in the brain that is gain, uh, I understand sequences, and we, there's no need to talk about time. <laughs> Just springboarding off of that, between the phase code and the lateral septum, and by the time you get to motor factors that use a rate code to control muscles, where do you think that conversion occurs? What do you think? Where should we go? <laughs> Prefrontal cortex. <laughs> <laughs> You, you take out the prefrontal cortex, the animal just walks right, there's no problem with it. So, so we decided to go to the lateral hypothalamus first and to see how this code is interpreted in the lateral septum by the downstream structures and the, 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 there are large areas of the hypothalamus that are innovated by the lateral septum and people are studying it for, for uh, aggressive behavior and sexual behavior, all sorts of things, but it, we are just looking at the motivational aspect of it. Maybe the mesencephalon would be a good place and Dean's question could be addressed there, that how you go from, 
One translation, which is all of the things that happen is in the brain from one synapse to the other, is, is transformations. Something totally different may emerge there, then the time will be disappeared. Maybe the lateral hypothalamic neurons don't have access to the theta cycle, then it's nonsense for that. So, yes, we, are, we agree that indeed this is the way. The other way to do, is there anybody who's working on brain machine interface? So the brain machine interface guys figured out subconsciously, without a, 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 a propaganda or anything or, or, or plan, that my goal is to move that damn cursor. So everything else is irrelevant. Unless it goes in the right direction, then the, the, the firing of this neuron and that neuron is totally irrelevant. And the message is that you have 100 neurons and three or four of them are helpful. The others you can throw away because they, are, they don't do, do very much. So you can do this strategy and then keep going back from the motor cortex and somewhere else and what is needed to do that and build up schizophrenia eventually this way. <laughs> I, I, I know that how difficult it is. It, it going backwards is the same problem, but I think it's an, not a better, but an alternative strategy. Yes, Mayank. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so if I were to zoom out completely and take your view that either there are sequences outside in the world or they're internally generated. And as you know, there is interesting debate about whether there is a pre-play in the hippocampus before the animal explores an environment. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? So that's an inevitable outcome, because if you look at the firing rates, the firing rates are very preserved under, under all conditions. If you look at the synaptic waves, they are also. So there is a preservation, and we have shown, as you know, the, the rigid cells and non-rigid cells. But you can uh, uh, also take another example, said the first ever the animal goes out of the nest. That is a play cell sequence. The animal has never been on this road, never been in this journey, at least not actively, because the mother was carrying it. The first time it goes out, there is a sequence. So it's not determined by the outside environment, but it it's just happens to match the, the... The brain is always doing something. There is not, no unknown for the brain. There is no, no, no novel completely novel thing in the brain. The brain always guesses something, and it spits out something. So this is my answer. Uh, the book has the colors, the book has the smell, the book has the, the, the texture, it has, has the touch. The features. All the features, but not the sequences. But those features have to be encoded. The features have to be encoded by the neocortex, yes. yes. Which is driven external. Yeah, so the hippocampus doesn't have that algorithm. So there's a beautiful, there are a couple of beautiful experiments. My favorite ever is, is this is what I offer side by, by Larry Squire. It's a real world experiment. They are, the hippocampus optimized people and the regular guys are walking in the UCSD campus. And then they later, uh, later on, they ask, you know, what do you see and so on. And then the details are enormous. It's fantastic. Even the, 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 the heavy hippocampal optimized persons can remember that was a, a yellow bicycle there was a fountain and things like that, and the number of items were worse, there is no question, but not dramatical. What is dramatically worse, they have no idea how to put the th events in order. The order is completely gone. So that seems to me that the, the key thing, or Laila Davachi and others have uh, fMRI experiments showing the, indeed that the sequence generation is the main job of the hippocampus. I mean, but so what you have is two systems then, right? You have an ordering system and a content system. Very well said. The hippocampus is the ordering system. Actually, I, I have a question which is uh, more philosophical than, uh, than in terms of neuroscience. So if I understand correctly your argument, put, you know, put very simply, is that in, uh, physics has gotten rid of the classic notions of space and time. Um, and so therefore, if we can get rid of them too and come up with a more elegant, more uh, you know, predictive system, then we will be putting together two very successful disciplines, right? But it is also true, and this and now comes the question. So it is also true that for our perception of time and space, you know, Newtonian notions are actually quite accurate. It's only when we get to infinitesimal small space and time that they break apart. So it's still possible 
that our notions of space and time, as far as behavior is concerned, will be more useful as predictive and organizing than the ones that, that you're trying to introduce, which could be complicating things to an extent that will make for a more complicated neuroscience and, and therefore less predictive, less power discovery prone. Is it true that in order to really know whether what you're proposing is right, it, it comes on, so the proof is in the pudding, meaning if we take your view and discard our notions of space and time, we should discover more things faster. If we don't, then maybe we should go back to Newtonian notions. Okay. Is that how you, how you see it? So remember what he said, now remember what I'm saying. Okay? <laughs> the last thing I want to do is complicate neuroscience. I try to simplify it. So the, from you go back to the lab and you do what you have done before. We continue doing our measurements because this is how science progresses. Space and time, distance and, and, and duration measures are the apples, uh, the, the bread and butter that we are using. It wouldn't matter. As long as you make discoveries, this is absolutely fantastic. But there is a totally big difference between saying that I am investigating a mechanism that doesn't exist. So I, I, it, 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 when it comes to say that the hippocampus is about space or hippocampus is about time, that's totally wrong because there is no, nobody can defend it. You cannot defend it. Nobody in this room can defend it. That it it's actually happens. Now, the, the other aspect is say, oh, we can relax because this is such a beautiful world that we build up in Newtonian. Everybody knows that we have to make distance, that we have to do time. No, true. I mentioned to you that there are many, many linguists who are working on this, that people have no clue about time. This is a human concept. I don't know, maybe, as I said, 20, 30,000 years. And then it accelerated with Christianity, with the clocks, when we, we started to have a bell. And then the worst thing that happened to, to contemporary life now is the tyranny of the clocks, because time is translated to labor. Labor is translated to money. Time is money. I'm not <laughs> preaching th things like that. So, so all of these things are serious, but they are not brain mechanisms. These are not something that is there above all and forever. And what I'm, when I'm saying that we have to think about first principles, that we have inputs and we have, have measurements of speed and we measurement of sequence and measurement of gain, we can build up exactly the same system without referring to the concepts that we made up. Children. Okay, there was one Children is very important. There. Okay, yes, go ahead. Two more and then, and then we, we go. Okay, go ahead. So in, in the uh, experiment with the rat, Yes. Right. You, there are error trials that <coughs> fails. And you mentioned, I think that you can still decode with some accuracy the upcoming error. Exactly. Trials. So I'm having, I'm, I guess I, I think I'm misunderstanding something. If the idea is that the hippocampus is sort of just organizing order of sensory inputs. No. Why, it's, no that's not it's, it's organizing sequences. Sequences. So is it, is it pl planned sequences? Exactly. So the, the, these are called commission errors. This is the same kind of thing that you drive and you go to work instead of going to, your, to see your mother. Nice. So the, the animal's belief is already there from moment on when the animal got, whenever they entered the wheel or when it was reinforced, they said, my plan is this. That's a messes up that plan. That's right. Okay. And then, if, in fact, the, the walls could be yellow rather than black. It doesn't matter. You don't see that. You just follow your trajectory, your belief system. And no, this is the human psychology is full with that. Okay, the last question. I think I saw your hand up a couple of times yeah. already. Yes, please. So, for the mirror, yes, okay. So, with these internally generated sequences, um, how do you think they change with motivation or attention? Okay. Or just the general state of Very the Very well said. So, what is gain? What is, well, you have gain, and you mentioned that, and, and, and attention. Attention, for me, is internalized speed. I say it again. Attention is internalized speed. That's a, that's a gain. And people who, uh, like uh, uh, Michael Stryker, you know, recently discovered that, oh, even viva neurons are affected by speed. Other, neurons, they, other people say, oh, it's, it's all about attention. Uh, so what, once you have a gain mechanism, which many people work on, maybe don't understand very well, but that's something that is real brain mechanism whether it's 
generated by footsteps or by acetylcholine or something else, we don't exactly know. But that's my answer. So once you have gain, you've got speed or a substitute of speed. And once you have gain, then you've got rate of change. All you need is a sequence and rate of change, and you don't need time. All right, please join me again to okay. thanking Yuri for this wonderful lecture.